Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. I'm Karim Sajapur of the Carnegie Endowment for uh, International Peace. Um, as many of you know, over the centuries, the Middle East has long been a battleground between great powers. And for uh, the last couple of decades, uh, the United States uh, uh, was, in some, in some cases, alone in that role as the, the lone great power. Uh, as we've seen over the last several years, it's become a return to great power competition in the Middle East, whether that's the Russian military incursion in Syria, uh, the Abraham Accords between Gulf countries and, and Israel, and the most recent uh, major diplomatic uh, event, the Chinese brokered rapprochement between Saudi Arabia and the United States. So our event today is called the Race for Power in the Middle East, and I'm joined by four terrific colleagues to talk about that. I'll introduce them briefly one by one, and we'll jump into the discussion. And please have your questions ready, both those of you listening online and in person, so we can, uh, we can uh, incorporate as many of them as possible. To my far right is my colleague uh, in the Middle East program, Fred Wary, who has written uh, perhaps more than anyone in Washington about this issue of great power competition in the Middle East. Uh, Marwan Mouashir is the um, vice president uh, at, at, at Carnegie Endowment, former foreign minister of Jordan, based in Amman. Um, Ahmed Hamzawi is the uh, director of Carnegie's Middle East program, uh, formerly based in Cairo. And to my right, Jennifer Kavanaugh, who's with the uh, Statecraft program here at the Carnegie Endowment. And um, I'd, I'd like to begin with Marwan, because Marwan is uh, the only one of us who is actually based in the region. He lives in Anaman. And Marwan, if you can just kind of set the stage of how great power competition uh, looks uh, for, for those of you who are actually based in the region. Thank you, Karim. It's a pleasure to be uh, back at Carnegie, and uh, this is my first live event in four years, maybe, or, or so. Uh, so it's, it's nice to be here. I want to make uh, 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 a couple of points uh, rather quickly because I know we're uh, short in, of time. The first point is that, and I never thought I would say this, this great compet power competition in the uh, region today does not involve the United States. In other words, the United States is no longer uh, a major player in the region out of its own choosing. Uh, the United States has uh, decided to pivot elsewhere from the region uh, a while back uh, for reasons that you know we all know the the, the, the Gulf War, uh, other other. Uh, uh, other issues, uh, the loss of oil as a major uh, commodity of importance and other issues. And so what we are seeing in the region, uh, uh, what I'm arguing is uh, uh, power, great power competition among the non-US actors uh, in the region. That does not involve the US. That doesn't mean, of course, that the US has withdrawn completely but it does mean that its involvement in the region is far less than what it used to be a decade or two ago. That's the first point uh, I want to make. The second point I want to make is that uh, the region has become even more anti-US than it used to be, and that withdrawal from the region has not helped the US in any way. It might not care about it, but it has not helped the US in any way uh, 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 in the region. Uh, today, uh, most of the positions that are taken, not just at the popular level, but also on the, at the official level, are positions that are largely due, due to an anti-US stand rather than a position on uh, its own merits. I'll give you an example, the Russia-Ukraine war, for example, whereas uh, it would have been second nature to think that uh, both uh, countries at the official level as well as on the popular level would stand by Ukraine unreservedly uh, as it has a similar situation to uh, Israel-Palestine and the uh, issue of the occupation of, uh, of other countries by force. Uh, in fact, the popular level is largely, not entirely, against Ukraine. And even at the official level, uh, it is the, the case as well. Uh, if you take Egypt as a case in point, Egypt today has strong military ties with Russia, uh, has strong economic ties with Russia, imports a lot of wheat from it, etc. So that vacuum that the United States has left is being filled by uh, by other other powers. Um, 
that's my second point. The, 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 the third point is there is no question that countries of the region are hedging their bets. And whereas it is true that uh, uh, they are not cutting off their relations, nor can they cut off their relations with the US, but they are certainly hedging their bets. And the US is no longer the only player in town. And so China, which has uh, uh, flexed its uh, economic uh, muscle for some time, is now also entering into the political sphere with the agreement, uh, with brokering the agreement to the, with, between the Iranians and Saudi Arabia. Russia, as I said, is a major player in Syria, uh, is a major uh, economic and uh, also has strong military ties with Gulf states, which is not something that uh, was the case uh, before. Um, the third point I want to make is that the center of focus in the Arab world today is in the Gulf, uh, without question. Uh, Egypt is no longer at the center of, uh, of the radar screen of the Arab world. Uh, nor, nor any other country in the region other than Gulf states. And all the good and bad things are happening in the Gulf. So uh, 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 with, uh, with, of course, uh, with, uh, with uh, support from, uh, uh, from these uh, great powers. The fourth point I want to make is that these powers that are uh, today uh, competing over influence in the Middle East are all authoritarian regimes. So we have uh, Russia, we have Iran, we have China, we have Turkey. All of them uh, are authoritarian regimes. Not that, of course, the United States has done much on the issue of governance in the region, but uh, I'm just simply stating a fact that today uh, uh, there is no emphasis whatsoever on governance by any, uh, 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 any country in the region or any uh, outside force trying to affect the region. And the last point I want to make, Kareem, uh, in the interest of time, is will we see the United States coming back to the region? I doubt it, uh, unless, unless it does that because of Israel. What is happening in the uh, uh, Israeli-Palestinian scene today is driving a wedge, uh, not just inside the occupied territories, but between the United States and Israel between the American Jewish community and the, uh, 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 the uh, Jewish community inside Israel. And what we are seeing is a move uh, to a situation not unlike the South African situation, so that I don't use the A word. And that means that if the Arab-Israeli conflict is not resolved soon, and I don't think it will be, the United States will have to deal with the fact in five or 10 years that it is supporting an apartheid state. And does the United, what does the United States do then? It is damned if it supports it and, if it, and, if, and it is damned if it criticizes it. So how is it going to deal with such a situation? To my view, this is the only scenario, to my view, under which the United States might and I, and I emphasize, emphasize might come back to, the, uh, uh, to looking at, at the region again. Otherwise, I think we're going to continue to see a competition uh, that does not involve the United States in the region. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marwan. You mentioned China, and China has eclipsed the United States as the primary economic partner for many countries in the region, not just US adversaries, but US partners as well, many of them in the Gulf. And that economic relationship with China usually comes with no strings attached in contrast to the United States that we're often asking for our partners to pursue economic or political reforms. So Amr, this is a question for you just broadly about the Chinese presence in the region. And can China um, eclipse the United States, uh, uh, not just economically, but strategically in the Middle East? Thank you so much, Karim. It's a pleasure to join you and join my colleagues. And thank you very much for coming and for joining us virtually. I, I would like to, to look at the question from, from the region um, to, to, to share how key powers in the region, of course, as Marwan referred to in the Gulf, but traditional powers as well um, uh, within the Arab world as well as in the non-Arab uh, part of the Middle East and Iran, Turkey, uh, as well as in Israel, how the Chinese role is perceived 
at the different uh, levels pertaining to hard power, so uh, economy, trade relations, investments, um, uh, politics, military ties, as well as um, the projection of Chinese soft power. Because I, I, I believe we're missing a lot if we only focus on what China is doing with regard to trade and investment. And um, I'll share some details. Uh, it's not only about the uh, political move, the strategic move of mediating between Saudi Arabia and Iran. It's, it's broader. It's been in the making for a longer time. And I, I, I would like to share some reflection on this. So the first point, so if you, if you look at, at China's role in the Middle East, I believe it, it's useful analytically to separate uh, between hard power and soft power. On the hard, hard power list, you have China, as you mentioned, Karim, becoming the trading partner number one with literally every single country in the Middle East. Um, and mind you, with countries which are um, uh, in conflicts, um, be it passive or active conflicts. Saudi Arabia and Iran launched a proxy war in Yemen for a long time. This did not hinder China from becoming Iran's number one trading partner and Saudi Arabia number one trading partner. Uh, China has uh, strong trade, economic, and technology ties with Israel. China has the same set of relations with every single country in the Arab world as well, as well not minding whether these countries have diplomatic relations with Israel or not. So China becoming the first trading partner in, in, in the region, in, in fact, in, 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 in a way which continues to grow. The Chinese trade as of 2021 in the region has reached in billion US dollars, around 330 uh, billion US dollars, as opposed to only 82 uh, with regard to the US. And in fact, the trajectories are uh, contradictory. Whereas the Chinese trajectory, uh, trajectory is growing, the uh, American trajectory is declining. So the US trade has declined, in fact, from uh, 120 in 2016 to 82 in 2021. The second point, which is important to keep in mind in terms of hard power, is the Chinese uh, infrastructure investments, which is part, of course, of the global role that China has been pushing forward um, within its initiatives, especially the uh, Belt and Road Initiative and other similar initiatives. China, between 2005 and two, 2021, has invested close to 220 a billion US dollar in the region, including in key Gulf countries. 21% of this amount has been um, uh, going to Saudi Arabia. 18% um, has gone to the UEE. Egypt and Algeria received around 12% of the total amount of 2020, um, uh, 220 uh, billion US dollar in Chinese investment. And as you said, Karim, the Chinese investments come, come with no strings attached, uh, no economic, no financial, no political strings attached, which make makes them quite the Chinese investment a welcome um, uh, tool for different Arab governments. Thirdly, politically, China has been in, active in the region in the sense of sustaining good diplomatic relations with every single country, not minding different conflicts uh, on the ground. So China, and this is a previous discussion you and I had, Karim, has, has pushed forward a big tent strategy for, for, for the region, not minding where governments stand on economic, political issues or regional policies, and moved from sustaining good diplomatic relations into signing strategic uh, cooperation agreements. Um, a first strategic cooperation agreement was signed a couple of years ago with Iran. A second one was signed with Saudi Arabia when the Chinese-Arab summit happened in December 2022. Similar agreements were signed with Algeria and Egypt um, in the last years as well. The third step in terms of uh, pushing forward from sustaining good diplomatic relations, not minding conflicts in the region, um, to signing strategic, uh, bilateral strategic cooperation agreements, the third step um, is to um, uh, initiate um, diplomatic ties at the regional level where China plays a mediating role. A first uh, big success was a Saudi-Iran uh, deal to restore diplomatic relations with Chinese mediation. But there are other issues which have not been reported um, as extensively in the US media. For example, as of now, we have four Arab uh, countries uh, putting forward applications to join the um, Shanghai co co Cooperation Agreement, including Saudi Arabia, the UAE, um, uh, Egypt, and Kuwait. 
we have Egypt that just joined the Asian Development Bank. Uh, in fact, uh, the application has been pending for some time. Now it's um, a member. Different Arab countries, reportedly Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, uh, Kuwait, and Qatar have applications to join the BRICS uh, with Chinese endorsement, <clears throat> and so on and so forth. So this is a, a third step in terms of pushing forward strong diplomatic relations and creating a web which is, um, uh, as Marwan was mentioning, not only parallel to the US, but probably to an extent replaces the strong web of diplomatic relations the US created in the region post-1990, um, uh, after the end of the Cold War. The second component is soft power. Um, uh, of course, I leave Jennifer uh, to reflect on military um, uh, ties, arms sales, which is part of the Chinese hard power as well. But from a soft power perspective, it's interesting to see what China is doing with its cultural centers, um, the uh, extensive uh, policies that China has developed with key countries in the region, including Algeria, Egypt, Iraq, um, uh, a country that receives uh, around 18% of Chinese investments, by the way, um, as well as in different Gulf countries, um, uh, academic exchange, student exchange, cultural, cultural exchange, the Confucius Center in the region um, have been getting um, uh, active in a way similar to key um, uh, Western cultural centers, and it projects Chinese soft power. And I believe that joining uh, China-led uh, regional organizations, be the, uh, the Shanghai organization or BRICS or other organizations, is a matter of project projecting Chinese soft power as well. Finally, China has no bad press in the region, which is a key point to its soft power. China has not been, been involved in regional conflicts. China has not used uh, its army in the region. China has not invaded an Arab country. And of course, uh, China has been quite supportive historically of the Palestine cause. China has been supportive of national independence movements in the region since the 1950s. I was reading before coming to you some of the historical data, and China was apparently the first non-Arab country to recognize the Algerian uh, national independence movement in, in, in the 1950s. So China has a good press in the region. It does not come with a great deal of uh, anti-ideological narratives. And, and, therefore, and it's perceived as a, P, as, a P, as a power for peace. It's perceived as a uh, superpower which pushes for um, conflict resolution and conflict mediation. And this is exactly the image that China um, cultivated with its um, uh, mediation between the Saudis and the Iranians. Uh, final point, looking ahead, I believe this role with its two elements, hard power and soft power, and the projection of China as a peace and stabilizing force for the region is bound to increase. Um, from a regional perspective, the question is less whether it will replace the U.S. or not. I, I believe this is more a U.S. framing. The framing in the region is that it's a welcome uh, diversity of superpowers. So countries in the region, including key allies of, of the U.S., are diversifying their uh, external ties um, to their benefits. So it's moving beyond hedging their bets. Uh, I agree with Marwan, but it's strategically becoming a key feature of what countries in the region are seeking politically, economically, as well as at other levels. Thank you. Thank you, Amr. So Jennifer, Marwan painted a portrait of kind of a, a post-American Middle East, that the, you know, America may not be coming back. You know, Amr painted a portrait of China's remarkable uh, economic, um, diplomatic, soft power presence. Uh, when you look at the region through the prism in particular of military sales, um, is, that, uh, is this narrative that we're talking about today, is, is the, do, the, do the receipts reflect this narrative or, or, or do you see it differently? So I think it's a little bit more complicated. I'm, I'm going to disagree a little bit with Marwan on this notion that, there is, um, that the U.S. Has, has actually withdrawn. Um, certainly, the level of U.S. security presence in the region is lower than it was at the height of the um, Iraq War. But if you look at troop numbers, um, security assistance, military exercises that the U.S. is conducting in the region, and even its bases, um, it's really pretty consistent with what you had in the like pre-2000, like around 2003, before the invasion started. You have about 30,000 to 40,000 U.S. troops in the region. You have dozens of bases, including several large military facilities, as well as pre-positioned stocks. Um, security force assistance is actually pretty extensive in the region. The country's um, in the region are some of the highest um, of recipients of security force assistance. Um, in terms of arms sales, U.S. arms sales are a bigger share of the total going to the Middle East now than they were before. It's about 54 percent 
of arms sales to the Middle East region come from the United States. Um, and the United States hasn't pulled back entirely from its more diplomatic role. There are new security alignments, things like the Abraham Accords and the I2U2 minilateral that includes um, India, Israel, UAE, and the United States. So the US is actually um, fairly active. I think one of the biggest changes, though, that we've seen is that Russia and China are playing a bigger role. So it's less about a withdrawal of the United States, although you sometimes hear that language used, um, and more about a shift in, in relative power. I mean, in some dimensions, the United States is actually currently putting more forces in the region. Like they recently redeployed the A-10s um, that included like boosted capabilities so they could have more missiles. Um, so they're, in some dimensions, they're actually doing more. Um, so I think that the narrative that the US has pulled out is a little bit uh, simplistic. And it's really about this change in relative power. So I'll talk a little bit briefly about what China and Russia are doing and sort of their presence in the region. If you start by looking at China, China's conventional military power in the region is very small. Um, they have the one base in, in Djibouti, which has a couple hundred people. Um, they have a, a, a few hundred people deployed on um, sometimes in UN deployments in the region. Um, but in terms of like forward presence, it's very small. Um, their arms sales have increased a lot, but it's still less than 5% of the total arms sales to the region. And if you look at what they're selling, it's primarily drones and missiles sold to countries that the US would never sell drones <laughs> or missiles to. So it's less about the Chinese replacing um, what the US was doing and more about the Chinese filling a gap that the US has left with the way they've structured their policy. Um, China does do some military exercises in the region, specifically with Iran um, and Russia. Um, and when you talk about their security alignments, which Amr mentioned several, that are, they, are, they are important, um, but they're very different than the types of alignments that the US builds. Um, they're very loose. They're multilateral. Um, they're non-binding. Um, they're often consensus-driven, which means that all that comes out at the end of these meetings is sort of a statement. Um, so I see them less as a replacement uh, for what the US does in the region and more as a, as a complement. Oftentimes, the US frames it as that, that this is a replacement, but I see them as overlapping. That's why I call it like a hybrid regime. Um, but we shouldn't discount the Chinese security presence in the region, because it is growing. And it exists in a couple of ways. The first is, um, as Amr mentioned, they have a lot of infrastructure investment in the region, uh, roads, um, ports, bridges, um, and, and construction projects. And so they have a lot of security associated with those to secure their investments. It tends to be private security, though, um, a pri private contractors. Not in the Russian private military company way, but just private contractors. Um, and the other big thing is around their ports. They have um, significant investments in most ports in the region, and those ports are often, often heavily securitized. So they're not bases in the sense that the US thinks of military bases, but they do have some dual use capabilities. And worldwide, China uses its maritime power, its commercial maritime power, to, to challenge maritime space in the region. So it's not a naval force. Um, but it's also not a purely commercial force. And so their security presence in the region, especially in the naval domain, I think comes through um, their role in these ports and the, and the commercial shipping capacity. Um, so finally, Russia. Um, Russia has historically been a big player in the region. Um, and that was reasserted, I think, around the start of the, um, the, their, their presence in Syria. Um, there are two main sort of ways of engaging in the security domain are number one, condition-free arms sales. Um, you know, they were known for that before the Chinese got involved in it. And number two, private military companies like the Wagner Group. Um, those are the and they've used their presence in Syria to build closer alignments with many countries in the region, like um, Israel and Egypt and Turkey. Um, so that has allowed them to take on a, a much bigger role. Um, going forward, I think. Um, there may be some changes in how, not their level of presence, but how they exercise that. Um, because of the war in Ukraine, it's extremely difficult for them right now to um, like actually deliver on any weapons deals they've made. Since about 2018, with the imposition of um, increased US sanctions, uh, Russian arms sales have really declined. And now they're, they've really cratered, <laughs> um, if you look at sort of the last year of data. Um, they're not really making any new deals in the region either. Their last deliveries to Egypt and Algeria, their two biggest clients, were in 2020. They are potentially making some news, new deals with Iran. Um, so that's one exception. But the question is, you know, can they actually deliver on those? 
because um, they're kind of stretched and they have other demands on those military capabilities in, um, in Ukraine. Um, but I, you know, I, they get a lot of residual um, influence from the arms sales they have made. It's really hard for countries to switch arms providers. If 60% of your stock of weapons comes from Russia or the United States, it's really hard to just decide you're going to switch because nothing is compatible. Um, so I think Russia's presence um, will continue despite the fact that they're going to have to shift to relying more on um, sort of their role as an um, interlocutor and a mediator and, and um, potentially using private military companies more and arms less, at least in the near term. Um, so you have these three very different models of security engagement, and that, as Amr said, allows countries to choose. They don't have to choose one either because it's not a straight replacement. They can be multi-aligned. They can balance between them and choose whichever um, great power is offering what they need in the moment for a specific issue. Um, and so that gives them um, a, a lot of flexibility and is really very good for them. And in, um, the last point I'll make is that, in, in my assessment, they're going to do that almost no matter what the US does. So there's this like um, significant debate in the UN, US foreign policy community about how we proceed in the Middle East. Do we send more forces? Um, do we pull forces back? Um, my sense is that countries in the region are going to hedge, and they're going to keep hedging because it works for them. And they're going to do that whether the US sends more troops and more capabilities, or if the US pulls back slightly. And I think that gives US policymakers the flexibility to make the decisions that fit best with US interests um, without having to make reactive decisions to what China and Russia are doing in the region. Thank you, Jennifer. I think the Biden administration's biggest concern at the moment is not Russian arms sales to Iran, but Iranian arms sales to Russia. I agree. <laughs> so uh, Fred, you've written a lot about this uh, through the perspective of, of US uh, policy. and. I'm curious for your prescriptions, how you think about this conversation. And let me uh, pose something to you, which a, a foreign minister from uh, an Arab country once posed to me, which was he said, listen, if, if you, the United States, are now, you're now entering a new Cold War with China and with Russia, you need all the partners you can get. And so you should not be alienating us, alienating us and pushing us into the arms of your rivals. How do you think about that? Yes, I'm going to address that, definitely. And uh, yeah, thanks to my colleagues for some very thought-provoking uh, discussion. And it was, Jennifer's presentation was really a, a good segue into what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to offer four uh, recommendations for the United States um, moving forward. And, and piggybacking on what Jennifer said, I do think it's, it's not so much the US military presence in the region that is diminished, but the strength of commitments in the region or the perception of those commitments. So again, if we look at the, the total number of troop levels, the exercises, the arms sales, the US is still uh, present. It's, it's reconfiguring its, its role. Um, with that in mind, I think it's important to acknowledge and appreciate China's reach. And I'm going to speak mostly about China here, uh, China's reach and influence in the region, but, you know, but not blow it out of proportion, right? I mean, I think we're kind of in this honeymoon period right now, there's a lot of breathless ant anticipation that China may uh, signal a new you know, era in the region rooted in trade, investment, growth, mediation, without the sort of baggage that the US has brought to the region. Um, I think we need to caveat that heavily. Um, it's not clear to me that China can really play the role of mediator in this region better than any other outside powers. Can they actually institutionalize the agreements they've made? Can they make them stick? It's very difficult in this region for any outside power to remain equidistant from competing poles. Um, the uh, Chinese had tried to mediate with the Israelis and the Palestinians back in 2017. It didn't work. The Shanghai uh, Cooperation Organization, I think, is sort of a club of autocracy. It's not really an institution for making agreements stick. I think throughout history, the arrival of one great power into the Middle East as it dis displaces another has has been met with a lot of anticipation that, that this new great power will act differently somehow, right? And it, it, these powers always revert to form, right? Partisanships, security entanglements, et cetera. And again, I think right now it's clear that China and Russia, they do offer something to the region states. And I think we need to look at this as supplementing, not supplanting the US role. These are, in many cases, quick solutions um, to the region's immediate problems without the baggage of human rights oversight. Um, but again, going back to something Jennifer said, can these outside powers really offer the sorts of security guarantees for their partner's defense that the US has provided? And the answer is no, they don't have the capability or the will. As Jennifer mentioned, China's agreements are non-binding. 
right? They're very loose. The U.S. is still fulfilling that primary security role. It's not clear to me that China can make the sort of human capital investments to improve governance in the region that will help these states surmount the problems that they're facing over the next decade to include climate change, the oil transition. In terms of public's perceptions of China, this is all relative to the U.S. Certainly, there's, there's an a, um, antagonism toward the U.S. role, and that translates into a more favorable role to, toward China. However, you're seeing a dip in opinion polls toward China in terms of economic engagement because of China's own domestic economic situation, and also Chinese goods are seen as inferior. So this is all relative. I think um, the second point I want to make is that this moment of great power competition and the way that the U.S. is seeing its partners behave, it really clarifies for the U.S. that the old way of doing business in the region, right, massive security investments to our partners has not yielded returns for us, right? It has not actually helped these states defend themselves. It has not translated into reciprocity or loyalty. It, when the chips are down, they haven't come to our side. So I think this moment that we're in right now is really a chance for the U.S. to rethink its heavily securitized approach to the region that's rooted um, in arms sales. And we can get into that um, later in the discussion. The third point is related to that. The U.S. should not feel compelled to outcompete with Russia and China in this region, especially on the arms and security market. As Jennifer mentioned, the U.S. still controls the preponderance of the market share in terms of arms. Our systems are seen as more reliable, advanced. We have a better uh, defense industrial base, especially with what's happening to Russia after Ukraine. So again, as I mentioned, these states are certainly supplementing U.S. capabilities. They're buying drones. They're buying missiles. They're shopping around. And that's fine, right? I mean, we have to lear learn to live with a bit of multipolarity in this region and not view everything through the lens of a zero-sum um, game. The other point I want to make is that these local states have gotten very skilled at playing this great power competition game to extract concessions from the US. The Chinese are courting us. You better give us a better deal because they're knocking at our door. This is a long-standing game that local powers have played in the region, You know, going back to the Cold War and the Nasser era, again, playing these powers off against one another uh, as a form of leverage. And I think that's going to continue. I think the U.S. has to look for ways to acknowledge and encourage constructive involvement from these other powers to include China in terms of infrastructure, right? These rail lines, that's a good thing. We need to explore more multilateral burden sharing in security matters, especially in the Gulf. The U.S. has played the role of policemen in the Gulf for far too long. We can look at a more multilateral security architecture for the Gulf. And the fourth point I want to close on is one going back to a point Marwan raised, and that pertains to the internal situation in a lot of these countries. The greatest danger of this new framework of great power competition is that it will blind us to the real challenges the region is facing, and those have to do internally with the, with the problems that, uh, com that started the Arab Spring that have not gone away, these socioeconomic problems. And I think the great danger is that the U.S. is now you know, viewing this lens through, viewing this region through the lens of power politics, where States are black box. It's only about your foreign policy. Are you with us against China? And what goes on inside your state is not a concern to the U.S. anymore, but it has to be, right? So the U.S. should not um, redouble its military presence in the region in, in trying to compete with China or Russia. I think it needs to look for better tools to address those internal socioeconomic challenges that I think pose a far greater threat to the region than any encroachment for, from China or, or Russia. Thank you, Fred. Marwan, did you want to jump in before we? I do, uh, because I think Fred makes a central point. The United States' involvement in the region cannot be reduced to its military footprint. Yes, if you want to look at the number of U.S. bases and the military arms sales to the region, yes, you can have a great argument that the United States has not pivoted elsewhere. But the fact is, even that military footprint has not bought it more influence. The United States has withdrawn from Iraq. The United States has withdrawn from Afghanistan. The United States has a limited involvement in Syria. The United States has a limited involvement with the Arab-Israeli conflict, other than the Abrahamic Accords, which, of course, have nothing to do with, uh, uh, with, uh, uh, with peace. The only real involvement of the United States in the region has been in, Ira in Iran, and that's off the, uh, the books so far. 
But other than that, gone are the days when the United States position was reiterated by most members, most uh, countries uh, in, the, in, the, in the Arab world. And today, the center of the Arab world, the Gulf, is not listening to the United States as much as it used to. So if you look at all these combined, then I still maintain the United States has pivoted elsewhere. It does not mean that it has withdrawn completely. But Fred makes the central point that if the United States wants influence in the Middle East, it has to revisit its, sec its, its, its obsession with security. And it has to look at the internal problems that the Arab world is, 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 uh, is undertaking. Otherwise, if it ever decides to go back to the Middle East in a serious way, not just in a military way, it will find a region that is completely transformed and over which it has very little influence. Thank you. We have about um, a little under 25 minutes for questions, and I just have two brief ones I'd like to ask, and I'd, I'd like to ask you uh, in the audience, both virtual and in person, if you can have your questions ready as well. Uh, my first question, I think, probably is most appropriate for Amr and Marwan, which is it seems to me there is this um, tension we have in Washington in that on one hand, over the last two decades, we've seen a lot of witnessed colossal failures uh, in America's attempts to transform Iraq, you know, transform Afghanistan, bring political change to the Middle East. So on one hand, there's an argument for humility. We've tried and we failed. We should be humble. On the other hand, there's an argument that we should not simply enable our authoritarian partners, and we should, in fact, condition our military and economic aid to our partners on whether it's political reform or economic reform or human rights reform. I'm wondering how both of you think about uh, this question. OK, so I guess we're going to showcase, but not only Marwan and, and I, but the four of us and probably you as well, we're going to showcase the diversity of opinions within Carnegie. I um, uh, happen to, to believe that the US, when it comes to uh, domestic issues in uh, Arab countries and Middle Eastern uh, countries, is best advised to engage, is best advised to, to listen, is best advised to uh, play less um, the role of, uh, we point out what needs to be done, um, is best advised to move away from seeing discussions about conditionality as the only way forward to get positive change, because if there are any lessons coming out of the region throughout the last 10, 12, 13 years, uh, and even earlier, since the invasion of Iraq, is that most domestic issues, economically, politically, even in terms of legal changes, cultural changes, are decided upon in a homegrown manner, are decided upon domestically. And what you can do from, from afar, from outside, is to engage constructively without conditioning your engagement. So I'm, I'm, but this has been my declared position even when I participated briefly in Egyptian politics between 2011 and 20, 2013. I do not believe that conditionality will take uh, the US or any external power for that matter far. It actually alienates regional powers. And I, I believe the region clearly key governments in the region perceive that there is no longer only a U.S. offering. There are offerings elsewhere. If um, the U.S. is, uh, is offering economic um, uh, and technological assistance condition, they can go and shop around somewhere else, which has been the case, even in rich oil exporting countries. I mean, Saudi Arabia, in its new economic city of Neom, the key uh, deals have been signed with Chinese uh, corporations, not with U.S. or Western corporations. And this is even not about conditionality, but it's about so, sort of a strategic framing. So my first point is, this is, I, I believe, for the U.S. as well as for external powers in general, uh, the way forward is to listen, to, to engage in humanity, and to, to learn that this region has given us enough evidence for the... the uh, uh, priority of domestic change and sustainability of domestic change. This does not mean that the region does not face key economic, social, and political challenges, but there are no quick fixes via conditionality. Um, mm -hmm. I, I believe the discussion is completely outdated and misguided. Final point I would like to make in this regard, Karim, on the U.S.-China comparison. I believe it's, it's, it's um, um, uh, essential that to, to look at it from the 
agency of actors in the region, and you can extend the a regional agency beyond governments. I mean, look at what key actors on the ground are saying. This is not simply about the U.S. baggage or um, uh, the, the bad press which the U.S. has been getting in the region after the invasion of Iraq. This is also about the fact that the U.S. did not deliver. I mean, the perception is that the U.S. has not been delivering. I mean, there are security arrangements between the U.S. and the Gulf countries. However, Aramco was uh, attacked. There are security arrangements. However, there are on, on the Gulf list, um, uh, there is a big missing uh, set of items where they demanded American support and did not get it throughout the last years. So even if, if the details do not hold, the perception is that the US has not been delivering recently, which is a big shift. And it pushes countries in the region to seek more collaboration with uh, other external powers in the sense of diversifying, um, uh, which takes us back, back to a debate Marwan will, will, will definitely be aware of. Back in the 1950s and 1960s, and Fred mentioned the 1950s and 60s in the region, there used to be a discussion about diversifying um, uh, arms sales. Where, mm -hmm. where do you get your arms from? From the uh, Western Bloc or the Eastern Bloc? And the region settled into a mixture of uh, here and there. And I believe this is exactly what's happening once again, but at more levels, technology, uh, infrastructure development, and so on and so forth. I'm reminded of something Kissinger once said, that in government, a lot of the big decisions are 51-49. So on this debate of humility versus condition, Additionality, no, my one word, you. I, I, look, I agree, uh, uh, Karim, and I think uh, the U.S. itself agrees that its record of bringing democracy to the Middle East is, uh, is dismal, actually. Whether it's the Iraq war, whether it's supporting authoritarian regimes, whether it's Iran in the 50s, I mean, it, it doesn't have a good record of uh, supporting or bringing democracy to the Middle East. This is something that is internal and needs to be internal. It is not something that is going to depend on, on outside forces. So, you know, I've always maintained this. The United States better uh, just uh, stay off uh, the, the, the reform process that is going in the region and leave it to people of the region, but it better not do, uh, you know, not do harm is the best it can do. And it has done a lot of harm as far as this particular uh, uh, issue is concerned. The other quick point I want to make is the, United, the, the region does not feel it, is, it needs to be part of the Cold War between America and China. What is going on between the US and China today is frankly of, of little importance to the region. It doesn't feel like the Cold War days that it has to be either with the United States or the Soviet Union. This is no longer the game in town. And so what the region is saying is, you guys want to fight, go ahead. We have other concerns, and we don't feel like we have to you know, stand with either you or China. We can do business with both. Well, that's a good segue for my follow-up for Jennifer and Fred, because indeed, if you speak to uh, another um, senior Arab official said to me once, you know, don't make us choose between China and the United States. But... This is actually kind of a specific example, Jennifer and Fred, of a question, what, what do we do when we see China uh, is attempting to build a military base in the UAE? Uh, if I'm reading you correctly, Jennifer, your uh, argument may be embrace multipolarity. It's not that big of a deal. China is still many years behind us. Is that accurate? And, and Fred, how would you respond to that? I think it's unrealistic for the United States to think that it can stop China from building military bases and expanding its security presence in the world. It, it is a global, um, you know, becoming a global superpower. And I think it's just simply unrealistic to think that we can um, keep, like freeze things in time um, and, and kind of contain China um, within China or within the um, Asia Pacific region. I, I think, I just think that's unrealistic. Um, so, so I think the answer to that is yes. Um, I think... The answer to that is yes, meaning what? Oh, yeah. The answer to your question about, you know, do I think that we should be more comfortable, like, accepting multipolarity in the so region? So if you're Jake world? Sullivan and you see secret intelligence, China is trying to build a military base in the UAE, do you call them up and say, stop that, or you basically say, fine? Well, I mean, I think Jake Sullivan and many in the U.S. and in the U.S. government are very concerned about that. Yeah, but they shouldn't um, be, you're saying, essentially. Um, I think 
they, they may be overreacting. I mean, okay. it's something to be aware of because obviously, you know, if China builds a military base in UAE or any other country, it limits the U.S. ability to operate in that country simply because of concerns about intelligence leaks and secret technology and things like that. Um, but, you know, China can have the same effect without a military base by forming close ties. Like there are countries in Southeast Asia where the United States can't really operate and there's no military base there. It's just that China's very present. So I don't think it's the fact of the base. Um, uh, you know, in addition, I mean, there's many other things you would look for if you're really concerned about Chinese power projection. They have aircraft carriers, but they can't exercise. They have never exercised with them outside of the region. That's a big barrier, right? So there's like a long way to go before we start to think that China's taking over the world with its military. Mm -hmm. um, and I just, I think that like looking at the intent, like is China's intent to become a global hegemon like the United States? I don't see the evidence there. Um, they do want a global military power, but they may use it in a very different way. And I think we need to be sort of aware of that. And and as Fred said, comfortable with the fact that the world is becoming more multipolar, and that is simply a fact that the U.S. needs to address um, in terms of developing policies that allow it to, um, to maximize the, and protect U.S. interests in a world where it can no longer control everything. As Marwan said, you know, the U.S. I don't think the U.S. has pivoted in security terms, in like military terms, but the influence it can get from that is very limited because of changes in relative power. Fred, do you want to tackle that? Yeah, just to echo what Jennifer said. I mean, this base in the, in the UAE, my understanding is it was so minuscule, and it you know they were basically hooking up the municipal water supply. It was operating you know, big, sort of blowing it out of proportion. And I think the the key concern from the U.S. perception was was one of sort of proximity and intelligence collection. But again, it's not a sign that the UAE's fallen into China's orbit or that the, the Chinese are going to exert this preponderance of military strength in that, in that region. Again, when you look at the actual numbers of troops, the presence, the exercises, the systems, I mean, the U.S. is still there. And so the question is, how do we, how do we live with it? How do we deconflict with China? Um, I do think the U.S. is correct in scrutinizing some of the high technology assistance we give to our allies. If that's going to fall into the hands of China, that's appropriate. We need to set up safeguards in terms of intelligence. But again, I think we have to accept that the cat's out of the bag, right? I mean, we're in this multipolar multi uh, environment. Um, I think we need, as Marwan said, to sort of reconfigure our presence in the region to what really matters. And again, I don't think the sort of post-9-11 approach to the region, which was so focused on, on dictating internal affairs and social engineering projects and, okay, we got to create a moderate form of Islam. We're really meddling in societies. And the, and the most tragic expression of that, arguably, was the invasion of Iraq, right? We were trying to implant democracy in the region. So that era is gone. But I don't think we need to go so far in the other direction that we completely withdraw and just trust these autocrats that are driving the wheel to, to take care of things, right? I mean, OK, you, you got it under control. There's de-escalation. There's detente. But these are, these are, this is a club of autocracies. These are dynasties, kleptocrats, theocrats. They don't have the interests of their people at heart. They're not making the sorts of sustained political reforms that these places need. And I do think the US has certain tools at its, um, at its disposal, not to sort of coerce them, and I don't think conditionality works, but I do think it's our, within our right to withhold certain types of assistance, including weapons that can be used against populations, and we don't want to be entangled in these states' military adventures. For instance, in Libya, the U.S. did not give the UAE drones. China sold the UAE drones. I was in Libya, and I saw firsthand what those Chinese drones did on the ground. And there's an example of China's so-called you know, peaceful approach to the region that enabled a, a very autocratic, um, meddlesome Arab power to project power in a way that violated arms embargo and had a devastating effect for civilians on the ground in Libya. And I don't think the U.S. should be a part of that. So. Thank you, Fred. Um, we have about 10 minutes for questions. Let's take some from the audience and maybe some from online. Uh, uh, we'll take a few at once. Uh, Rafi, we'll come to second. Please, in the front minute. Green shirt. Please, if you can identify yourself and be as concise as possible. Sure. Hi, my name is Elaine. I'm, I'm a local student. Why so little mention of Tunisia? I know it's not a region of focus right now. It's not in the Gulf. But um, in this pivotal moment of Tunisian history, is there the potential of China to potentially replace or partly replace the IMF loan that Saeed just rejected? 
Thank you. Maybe that's a good question for Amr uh, Rafael. Um, so I am Rafia from Carnegie Endowment, and um, actually thank you very much for this discussion. Um, I have a lot of questions, but then I have um, two, one for Amr and Marwan. So what we need from the United States, what precisely we need in the region from the United States, if it is proven that it didn't do well in terms of democracy, governance, and all the issues, um, we think they are important, and especially after both of you said that we need um, a homegrown, um, you know, social change, a political change. And so what the importance of the United States? Why, why it is important for us um, that the United States still play a role in the region if, if we don't want them to, in, to interfere or to tell us what to do? And that's how usually the United States aid or, um, uh, you know, um, interference, it has to come with conditions. And as Fred said, these are autocrats. We, um, you know, experience them uh, many, many years and nothing happened from their side if there is no pressure put on them. Not that I prefer that something come from outside, but then we are in this dilemma uh, after the Arab Spring uh, and before the Arab Spring. And of course, there was a lot of hopes after the Arab Spring that something home, homegrown would change, um, you know, and would lead to democratization in the region. So this is for Amr and um, Marwan. Uh, Fred and Jennifer, I have a question. Um, apart from or away from the uh, security and the military presen presence in the region, um, you think it's important, but I always have this question. Um, is the United States protecting the region from, I don't know who, it's, or it's only from Iran? You know, um, in terms of security, always in the Arab region, um, most of us thought Israel is the main enemy for the region. And then the role of the United States mainly is to uh, have Israel safe from any threats, any security threats comes from the region. And again, Abraham Accord, it didn't lead to um, to peace, as Marwan, and I agree with him totally. It just to make Israel safer. And um, that is the role of the security and the military presence, as I see it as a citizen of that region. Um, the United States played uh, in the region. It didn't lead to, le uh, to peace, um, like um, in the region at all. And it didn't lead to democratization at the, uh, or to, to democracy or any kind of positive change. So what you see, the American positive role in the region, other than the security presence Thank or military. You. Thank process. you. Uh, Mohammed, were there any questions online? Yeah, do you want to uh, uh, Since we're low on time, I'll just synthesize some of the comments and questions. Um, the first kind of batch or bundle of questions asks about kind of the comparative credibility of uh, US and Chinese um, security guarantees or just involvement in general commercial or military. So one of them asks, uh, since the US uh, withdrawal from Afghanistan, Iraq, and also just Chinese performance in Africa and in Sri Lanka, what you would think uh, the, the perception in the region is uh, towards military and uh, economic performance. A second question asks, uh, from a specific uh, regime-centric uh, uh, security uh, focus. So in terms of uh, Chinese versus uh, American um, performance, do you think either actor is able to deliver regime security, not uh, regional security? And uh, can you just evaluate those? Uh, thank you so much. So we have about five minutes left. And um, I'd like to give you each a last opportunity to to, to speak, Amr, there was a specific question to, on Tunisia, which I think probably you're best equipped. Um, but I will, why don't we go in and perhaps reverse order so we can uh, start with Fred and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll end on uh, Marwan. Sure, let me just try to bundle those and I'll address my colleagues' uh, comments. On, you know, and I think your, your question is, well, what's the end state of the US security presence? Who are we protecting these states from? And I think that's a great question to ask. And I've been asking it for so long um, I think in many cases it's become sort of a self-fulfilling or self-perpetuating mantra, this notion of security assistance and the, the idea that we need to bolster our partners. 
What is partnership? Partnership should be a means to an end, but in, in this case, it's become an end to itself. I mean, a lot of people in the U.S. military, what is our goal? It was to protect these states from Iran, but now they're um, obviously making peace with Iran, but even before that, they, they were not sufficiently equipped where they could defend themselves against Iran without our assistance. So the whole enterprise of massive arms sales wasn't actually equipping them to defend themselves. There was some helpful um, assistance in terms of missile defense, in terms of maritime. I asked a senior US defense officer, I said, why does this particular Arab state need the F-35 advanced fighter? What, what are they gonna use it for? Who are they gonna use it against? And he said to me, I can't really answer that. We're, we basically wanna give it to them so that they won't buy from wherever, China, Russia. So this is the logic, the logic. There's no logic. So I, I argue, and just to conclude, that we need to widen the aperture of what the U.S. is doing in the region to, make, to create more space for non-military involvement to include from the State Department, to include from the USAID. Governments in the region love to talk to the Department of Defense. They love to talk to CENTCOM because it's great. But if we diminish that part of U.S. policy, we open space for USAID, State Department, um, things like economic statecraft, exchange, helping these states with climate change. I'm not arguing that the U.S. has the silver bullet in all of these um, problems, nor should we, as you said, adopt a lecturing attitude. But I do think we need to shift, um, shift our focus away from the security uh, track. Thank you, Fred. <clears throat> Jennifer. You know, so from, it's a really great question, what are the benefits of, of U.S. presence in the Middle East, military presence? Um, from the U.S. military perspective, I can tell you sort of like what they see as or how they would define it. Um, you know, the first is this idea that um, there is general benefits to having U.S. For forces deployed abroad, that this protects this, um, you know, rules-based order, um, and that were, that were U.S. forces to pull back, disorder would reign, right? Like, I don't really think there's a lot to that argument. Um, th there, there are some benefits to having... Um, like research shows that there are some benefits in terms of uh, preventing conflict to having um, U.S. forces deployed, but those uh, benefits are, are very conditional. Um, so you know whether that doesn't it doesn't always apply. It hasn't always applied in the Middle East, certainly. Um, the second thing that they point to is this idea of like preventing the resurgence of terrorism. So there's an idea um, that um, many people in the foreign policy and military community articulate that like if the U.S. pulls back, terrorist groups like ISIS are going to become resurgent. Um, and uh, when the leaders of like CENTCOM get up on the hill, they often say, well, you know, these, since we pulled back our presence, these groups have become stronger and are now going to be able to strike the United States, right? That's very common, um, that, that, this, that this is part of their testimony. Um, so there's a sense in which the, for the, pres the, the forces need to be present to, um, to kind of like as a preventative measure. Um, but... Again, um, the, date, the evidence and data on that is, uh, is, um, is, is suspect. Um, I think more, more realistically, there's a lot of path dependence, right? Like the forces have always been there, and it's difficult. Like it's a part of like um, the U.S. role in the world is to be military present, right? And that is path dependent. Once they're there, it's really hard to get them back because it's a change in the status quo, a change in U.S. strategy. Um, so whether or not they're actually serving like a useful purpose on the ground um, is sort of hard to disentangle from all these narratives that have built up over time. Um, you know, now I think they, the United States military sees Iran as a as a as a threat. I think you, the U.S. government generally sees the Iran as a threat and sees U.S. forces as being important um, to help corral um, a, a coalition against Iran. Um, you know, whether or not that's true or whether or not that works, um, I think sort of remains to be seen. Um, just briefly, this idea of, you know, whether or not, um, you know, sec at least security guarantees compared to you know, U.S. and China, um, the question from online. Um, I, you know, I don't think that many countries in the region or in the world have an illusion that um, China is going to, you know, rush to their defense. Like, that's not really how Chinese military, military security or any type of partnership works. Um, as I said, these are sort of like loose and non-binding. Um, so in that sense, I think um, the U.S. probably does have like a better reputation, but then their reputation comes with a lot of strings, right? It comes with um, uh, political and economic ties and um, conditionality, which we've already talked about, and like a pretty high rate of failure. Um, the U.S. isn't always successful when it gets involved. So it's really tricky, right, of like, you know, 
<laughs> which evil do you want? Um, or like, you know, which, um, which of these choices is best? Which is why I think a lot of times they go with China. They'd rather be on their own um, and not have the ties. Thank you. Uh, Amr, do you want to take the Tunisia question? Sure. I mean, very briefly, China is um, uh, globally and re uh, regionally a cautious player. So it's not, it's not, I mean, the way we, we sometimes in the region tend to see China as eager to replace um, the U.S. or the replace Western power, that's not how they look at their role. I mean, they would like to add their offering into the mix of what's being offered in the region. So I do not believe that China is up for replacing or sub um, uh, for supplementing, yes, for replacing now. And, and China has been uh, economically uh, and from a, from a lending perspective an active power um, uh, in different places in the region, uh, in Sudan, in Egypt, uh, Algeria to an extent. So uh, Chinese um, uh, banks uh, have been lending to, to, to different governments in the region, but not in a way that they would replace what's coming from the IMF or from Western uh, capital. Second point I would like to make on, on uh, which, which is the question, before getting to Rafia's question, on, on uh, security arrangements and, and, and arms sales. I, I, I believe um, that the region has, since, in fact, the collapse of um, uh, the Soviet Union and the end of the Cold War in the 1990s, has been seeing a, a, a rise in regional uh, warfare in, in, in different ways, as well as in civil wars, in which a plurality of weapons and weapon systems have been used. Um, uh, American uh, weapon systems have been used in the proxy war in Yemen. They have been used elsewhere. So I do not think that we can only single out and say Chinese, I mean, uh, re in reference to Fred's point, Chinese drones were used in Libya. American weapons were used in Libya as well. American weapons were used in Yemen as well. This is the lack of security arrangements in the region. And the quick response that I have to this is that there is a failure from a US perspective to be the only guardian of security arrangements in the region. It has not worked out. Finally, on what we need from the US, when the Cold War ended Rafian and the Soviet Union collapsed, America promised two things to the region as the one hegemon, as the one hegemonic power in the region. Peace between Israel and Palestine based on a two-state solution. Big failure. And the US has been biased structurally since the launch of the Madrid conference. And, 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 and Marwan can, can say more about it because he, has been, he was part of the process for several years. And the second was economic uh, prosperity. And then it was re-engineered re after 9-11 and with the invasion of Iraq to be socially engineering and politically engineering Arab societies from within, and big failure. And my lesson at the two levels is the US is better advised to listen, to engage, and to trust that this region is not only about uh, undemocratic governments, it has still, and in spite of authoritarian pressures, vibrant civil societies that are trying to push forward and understanding of what they want, how they would like to see their future. And the US is better advised to listen and not to come across not only in a lecturing way, but as saying, well, here is uh, sort of what we would like to see. This did not work out and it will not work out. Thank you, Marwan. It's fitting you're our boss, so you get the last word. So here's how I will answer Rafia's question. The Arab world today is already in a post-rentier stage. It's not yet maybe in a post-oil stage. Oil is still important. But the old patronage models of governing the Arab world are out, are over. What is the status of the Arab world today? We have three categories. We have the category of failed states. Lebanon, Yemen, and I don't need to enumerate the rest. We have the category of thriving states, and these are mostly the Gulf states. They're not employing any, a political model, but they're doing a lot of economic and social reform. And then you have the third category of the struggling states. They understand the oil era is over. They understand they cannot keep relying on oil, but they don't either want to or they don't know how to make the transition. And they are struggling. You know, Jordan, uh, Egypt, uh, I don't also need to, to enumerate. What the United States can do is help these countries as they try to build new models of governance. Not tell them, you know, what the model is, but help them uh, uh, grow these models of governance. In, if the United States is going to see the region as it did before, and Fred makes the point brilliantly. If it wants to see the region in, in a, through a security prism, it better not do anything. 
let it stay at home. But if it wants to help, this is how it can help. Not by supporting uh, you know, stability through brute force, as it did in the past. I, I keep saying we need to, to support stability through reform, not stability instead of reform. That's what the United States can do. I'm not, I don't think it's, it's, it's in that mindset. But if it ever pivots back, you know, this is the mindset that I would like to see. Thank you so much, Marwan. And thank you all so much for listening in person and online. And please join me in thanking the speakers. <laughs>